much. And I'm really glad that everyone's here to join us today to learn about um, Western hand fans, which are the type that I collect. Um, I got interested in hand fans because when I was living in San Francisco, there was an antique store down the street from me and I went in and I was looking around and they had a, a variety of framed um, fans on the wall and they were just very pretty and I really liked them. And so that's pretty much how I got started. And you know, hundreds of fans later, <laughs> here I am. So uh, I'm going to talk today about kind of fans in their fashion context, like what is going on with fashionable fans? Um, what are women mostly wearing to go with those fans in the context of fashion? And then where were women purchasing these accessories and kind of what were they using them in? So I have a presentation and then I also have some fans from my own collection that we'll use a webcam to look at so you guys can kind of see how large they are and maybe some of the closer details. And then um, hopefully we'll be able to have some time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's see. All right, and let me make sure that I'm gonna do a play, play slideshow. All right, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, looks, good. looks good, great. So the topic of this is fans in fashion and Western culture. And so I was really trying to avoid kind of doing a timeline, um, both for fashion and for fans. But honestly, like that is one of the best ways to kind of understand how the fashion changes over time and what kind of improvements we're seeing in shopping and manufacturing. And so I, I did default to that, except for some specialized topics. Um, so let's talk about fashion. This will be mostly focused on Western women's fashion. Um, there, of course, is a very long history of um, fans in Eastern cultures in Japan and China, um, which are the origin of the folding fan. But they were really beginning to be very popular in Western culture around the 18th century. So, um, and how are people learning what is fashionable? So this is an example of the ladies magazine, which started publication in the 1770s. And here you can see a lady in full dress in August of 1770. Um, she's of course holding a folding hand fan. Um, and these magazines had um, topics related to womanhood, stories, um, tales about travel, and also um, had, um, you know, fictional um, serial stories as well, but also had fashion plates. And um, so these were widely printed and accessible um, to kind of middle and upper class women. Uh, so you could see kind of how upper class people were dressing and what accessories and kind of that consumer culture. Um, like, let's quickly look at a timeline of kind of the mid 18th century. Um, so in this era, we're really seeing um, very wide supported skirts, um, kind of extravagant hairstyles towards the 1770s with um, powdered hair, um, dressed hair that's very tall. And the dresses are very large, right? There's a lot of material. Um, there's a lot of skirt supports and they're like a very sumptuous and ornamented fashion. And that's really very much reflected in the hand fans of this era. So in the hand fans of this era, we're seeing relatively large fans, I would say at least 10 to 12 inches long. And they're very ornamented. Um, some of them are from the export trade from China. Some of them are produced locally in France. And high end fans of this era, you know, are made with ivory, bone, uh, mother of pearl inlay, uh, there are plenty of fans though that are just wood from this era and we can see that there's a highly ornamented leaf so kind of the paper vellum or skin um, or silk uh, kind of part of the fan that's at the top is the leaf and then the um, rest of the fan are usually called sticks right so there's a couple of kinds of terminology but for the most part this is a folding fan 
and it has a, a leaf and some sticks that those are attached to. This motif that we're seeing here for the, the mid 18th century has a sign of central um, scene that's happening and then two scenes on the right hand side. So it is extremely typical of um, 18th century fans that they kind of have this three part motif on the leaf. Um, some of them are allegorical, uh, some of them are modern scenes, some of them are, you know, mythology, but um, this is very typical. There's, we also see a lot of examples of just one large scene, um, but either one large scene or three separate scenes are, are very typical for 18th century fans. And again, this is, um, I think, Queen Charlotte on the left and a fashion plate from around the same point of time. Uh, both these women are holding fans and you can see how large this fan is in comparison to the queen's hand. Like it is definitely larger than her hand is. It's kind of almost as long as her forearm. And that is an accessory fashion that is kind of balancing out how large her dress is um, and how sumptuous her dress is. And even if we're just looking at fashion plates where somebody isn't necessarily wearing, they're still wearing probably yards of silk. Um, but they're also like the hand fans of the era are, are wide to match kind of the fashions of that, that day. All right, and, and then here's another example just of a um, printed cotton fashion from the 1770s and another fan. And again, you can see that there's kind of this central um, scene for the fan and then kind of these, um, at least two side scenes. Um, and the sticks are very ornamented. So in this era, um, expensive fans that you're purchasing have um, gold leaf, they have inlay, they have mother of pearl, ivory or bone sticks. Um, people could remove the leaf if it went out of fashion and replace it with another one. Uh, they might have that done at a jeweler or a special fan maker, um, but leafs were definitely for upper class um, they were an expensive fashion accessory. I mean, the sticks were definitely a fashion accessory. All right, so where were you purchasing your fans? So fans, first of all, were made um, by fan makers. So it is a uh, specialized trade um, that people trained in. There were definitely female fan makers. So here we're looking at two trade cards um, I believe these are both from London. And you can see that one is named Martha, the other one's named Mary. So um, there were definitely women who were in the fan making trade. It was closely related to um, other kinds of trades, sometimes jewelers. Jewelers also made fans. And then you could have um, people who made other kinds of wood items. You see here, there's a turner and handle maker. Um, that, you know, that could be related because uh, a lot of fan sticks are made of wood. So um, you could definitely purchase your fans from a specialized fan maker. Um, so this is kind of the later 18th century and we're starting to see kind of a slimmer silhouette here, right? So go gone are the wide skirts from the um, mid and 1770s, the mid 18th century and the 1770s. And we're starting to see kind of a narrower um, silhouette more of a classical influence that starts coming in in the 1790s. Um, and so we're gonna see that also reflected in the fashion accessories like fans of the era. So here's a fan. And again, you can see that it retains this kind of very characteristic 18th century style where it has a central scene and then two side cartouches. Um, this style of sticks where there's a lot of space between the sticks. So they're not like stacked right next to each other, but you can kind of see the background in between. And then on the right-hand side, you can kind of see the end of this fan where there's a, a wide part that, um, of the stick that touches the leaf. That is also very characteristic of 18th century fans, particularly mid to late 18th century. Um, but you can see that going along with the fashion, this is much simpler. It's kind of, it's elegant. It's not overly ornamented. And if you think of it kind of in a classical sense, right? And classical art, uh, you know, Roman and Greek um, things were very popular at this era. A lot of young men would do a grand tour um, of, you know, of places in Europe, including um, Italy and Rome. And 
So you can kind of see how this is a, a simpler version that is, is matching the fashions of the era. So let's look at the fashions again. Here we see, you know, definitely a slimmer silhouette. You're not seeing the very wide skirts of the mid um, 18th century. Um, and again, you can see how large these fans are based in comparison with the um, hands of the women who are holding them, right? So the fans are definitely larger than their hand and kind of, in some cases, almost as large as their forearm. And again, here's this comparison. So here's this like narrower, more elegant um, and classical silhouette, right? It's more of a column instead of a wide skirt. And this fan on the right hand side is reflecting that. It has some ornamentation. It definitely has what we would call sequence. Um, and these uh, very nice bone sticks. This is probably the, the sticks are probably made of bone on this one. And the leaf is probably either um, a paper or silk. So again, like the previous example we saw, there's a lot of space between the sticks and it has that very classical 18th century part where it's wider, where the end of the stick is wider, where it meets the leaf. So here's another place that you could buy fans in the 18th century, um, both in, in Europe and in the colonies, in the Eastern colonies of the US. Um, here is an advertisement for a milliner who's female, right? It's her trade card um, and she is in London. On the right hand side, we see a, um, a French fashion plate of a milliner. So you could either go purchase your items in a millinery store or um, you know, milliners would come to you and sell items. So you can see that she's carrying this box and that's what she's got her wares in. She's going to sell them out of that box. Here is a uh, milliner's advertisement from Philadelphia. And here's another a print representation of a milliner's store. Um, I believe this is from an English publication. So you can see that there's a wide variety of clothing items that would have been sold. So there's both undergarments, there might be um, dresses, there might be um, handkerchiefs and hats. Um, we would typically think of hats from millinery stores, but they sold in the 18th century, they sold a much wider variety of items. And on this left-hand side, it's, there's, it's not good resolution, but Basically, um, milliners would take out advertisements in newspapers of the era and they might say like, um, newly arrived from England, I have um, red cloaks or I have the most fashionable hat of this type. Um, and so they're basically letting everyone know that they have new inventory and um, like what kinds of inventory you can buy. So it's a really good, good way to figure out like what were people purchasing in different eras. Um, because you can kind of see the advertisement for what milliners were saying that they had in their shops. And so um, fans would definitely be one of the kind of things they could buy. And again, um, you know, there's a vast range of, of what you could purchase. The um, 18th century definitely had printed fans, so fans that were printed on paper. And so you could purchase fans that had um, bone or wood sticks, and then you could um, refresh your fan with a new leaf um, once your old fan was out. And so we're also starting to see in this era um, printed fans that are specifically fashionable. So there's some examples of fans that have to do with literature that were printed with um, quotations. You see ones that were printed for exhibitions. Um, so celebrating exhibitions, celebrating um, hot air balloon ascents. So those are some of my favorite fans are ones that celebrate hot air balloon ascents. Um, and then there's there's map fans. So if you were traveling, you could buy one that had um, a map of the area or as a souvenir. So uh, we're definitely seeing a huge proliferation, proliferation and popularity in hand fans in the mid to late 18th century. All right. So um, kind of continuing here along our fashion timeline. So this is, uh, I guess, what's typically called the Regency era. And if people are fans of Bridgerton, um, that's kind of the era that that, that show is set in. Um, and you're definitely seeing very strong classical influence, especially in the early part of the 19th century here. Um, you're seeing these very um, beautiful, like uh, white gowns that appear to be very simply constructed, but um, as customers know, they, 
they typically have uh, underpinnings, you know, there's stays under those, uh, there's petticoats under that, there's probably a complex system of how that attaches, um, you know, a, like a front, a fall front of the dress. So, um, but they, they combine to make this very beautiful classic simplicity. Um, and then as we get later um, in the first two decades of the 19th century, we start kind of seeing that skirts get wider again. There's more emphasis on ornamentation around the hem. Um, and then and we start getting um, kind of bigger, puffier sleeves uh, and hairstyles start, start growing again. They start going up. So, you know, we went from these very large mid 18th century skirts to kind of this classical simplicity and then skirts are getting larger again as we progress through these first uh, two decades. Um, and so we're also getting new fashion magazines at this time. So if people here are big fans of, you know, Regency romance novels, they um, no doubt have somebody reading Ackerman's or La Belle Assemblée. Um, and those are two real fashion magazines of the era. Um, they were published pretty much from the first decade of the 19th century, I think to maybe um, at least the 1830s. Um, and you can see here the repository, which is Ackerman's, it actually has um, little pieces of fabric that came as part of this magazine. So uh, women were definitely able to find out what the most recent fashions were and then have their own fashions to match those, either whether they were making their own clothes or whether they were going to a mantra maker or, or somebody else to have their clothes made. All right, and this is an extremely distinctive fan style for this era. Um, so we'll see a little bit later how fashion kind of repeats itself, but this is really um, a very distinctive Regency era fan. These were popular mostly from the 18, from I would say like the early 1800s to maybe the 1830s. And then they're, they're not really popular after that. Um, this fan is made of horn. Uh, so horn is kind of, um, you know, I've heard it called the, the plastic of the Middle Ages, right? So people were able to kind of essentially melt it down and pour it into molds. So you get kind of um, a proliferation of utensils and accessories that are made of horn. You get kind of horn hair combs, you, and you especially get these horn hand fans. Uh, so these were made in molds. Um, and you can see that there are ivory or bone ones that also are a contemporary with this era and those were carved. Um, and of course, like an ivory fan, you know, was definitely a luxury item there. Um, then. But you can kind of see that there's a style that's been retained from the 18th century here, right? So if you're looking at this fan, there's three different motifs, right? So even though we've gotten more of this um, classical look with the light and airy horn, it's like very much translucent. We have these three painted motifs and that's kind of echoing the style of the 18th century. This is a, another uh, version of a horn fan from this era. And again, we're getting kind of the natural look here. So um, kind of natural motifs, uh, flowers, vines in um, embroidery. I've seen a lot of like bugs and bees in embroidery of this era. Um, so we're also seeing those kind of motifs echoed in fans. So this one is, is also horn um, and it's painted here with these flowers. And here on the left, we have a woman who's holding a fan. So she's wearing kind of, you know, a typical Regency dress. It's, it's made of, um, you know, black silk or velvet. She has the short sleeves, the, the short bodice that comes just below the bust line and then falls from there. And she is holding a horn fan in this portrait. Hers is definitely um, of a much more ornamented shape. And it's also, it's got um, gold leaf or gold paint on it and it probably has um, sequins to help catch the light. So very typical of that era. And we see, um, you know, a diversity of these horn fans. Uh, you can see that it's pretty small. Her, her fan is not um, that large. It's about the size of her hand. It's, um, it's a little hard with the perspective, but it's, it's not nearly as large as the fans we were seeing in the 18th century. And then on the right-hand side, we can see this fashion plate 
for around um, 1815 with these uh, fashionable costumes for February. So again, the bust line is, um, you know, the bodice of the dress is coming to right under the bust line and then it's falling in this nice column. Um, and it's a kind of a very simple era compared to the very ornamented 18th century. Here are two more dresses from around, um, you know, 1810, 1815. Again, they have that very simplistic look. And here on the right-hand side, we have a fan that is much more like the one that the lady's wearing in the previous portrait, where it's a horn fan that has gold and sequins ornamentation. All right. So as we progress into the 1830s, the 1830s is an era of costume that I have really started to love. Um, I love the ridiculous profusion of sleeves. I love how ornamented everything is. I love the high crazy hair and just how all out people went from like around 1830 to maybe around 1835. Uh, it's just a really fun costume era. But we can see that skirts are definitely getting larger here, right? So um, the waistline is coming down. So if you look at this woman portrayed as 1832, her, her waistline has come down more towards the natural waist. And as we progress through the decade, the waistline continues down to be at the natural waist with kind of a, a bodice that's pointed below the waist. And we start having these belled skirts that are supported with um, multiple petticoats or corded petticoats, right? And then these large sleeves are sometimes supported kind of with um, these really fun sleeve pillows, essentially. So um, they were kind of uh, an undergarment. They kind of look like water wings and you they were stuffed with down usually or other stuffing materials. And they would help hold up the sleeves of these really large 1830s gowns. Um, so you get all sorts of like fun, um, fun undergarments. So these women in this era, fashionable women, are definitely wearing stays or corsets um, that are helping to support and enhance their shape and give shape to their clothing. Right. We start seeing um, more feather fans in this era. So um, before the folding fan was popular um, in, I would say, 16th and early 16th and 17th century Europe, we saw what's called a fixed fan and they kind of look like a flag or a circle and and there were some um, ostrich or other feather fans that were popular then but we don't really see those a lot in the 18th century when the folding fan takes over. We start seeing these um, turkey feather and um, peacock fans um, and other other kinds of feather fans that are ornamented and this style persists. So I would say maybe this style starts coming into popularity around the 1830s. And we see fans in the style all the way through, I would say at least the 1920s. Um, this kind of um, fan that has feathers um, attached to each other and then painted is, is definitely a very popular style um, throughout much of the 19th century. And a lot of these were made in China for the export market. So there are fans that are made in China for consumption within the home market. And then there are fans even with kind of more Asian motifs, but they were made for the export market to um, European nations. So, um, so even if you see something that has kind of an Asian motif, there's still a decent possibility that it was not intended for home consumption, that it was specifically made for the export market. All right, and so this is kind of like my current favorite style here. Um, you can see the very, the contrast here where we're getting this like essentially extreme hourglass shape with the very puffy large sleeves, the very puffy skirt, um, and it kind of narrows into the waist. So the stays and corsets of this era were not necessarily tight lacing, um, but they're essentially creating this optical illusion by having a very large upper and a very large lower part of the, the costume. Um, both these women are holding fans. There's the woman in the white on the fashion plate is holding a fan. Again, it's not super large. It's not as large as her forearm, 
The woman on the right is holding a, um, a pierced, um, probably ivory fan that is very similar in construction to the bone fans that we were looking at earlier. So that style kind of um, persists into, I would say the 1830s, definitely. And then other kinds of brise fans. So fans that don't, don't have a folding leaf are, are typically called brise. And, you know, that is a popular style of fan, but um, this kind of style with the pointed tip and the, the piercing is very popular from, you know, the early 1800s to the 1830s. All right. And here's another fun example. So this is probably a cotton dress with a roller print. So there's, you know, new advances in printing. So now we have these, like this beautiful turkey red and this roller printed fabric. Again, those huge sleeves and the big skirt. And this is one of my favorite fans on the right-hand side. I believe it's from the Victorian Albert Museum um, in the UK. And you can see all these women are dressed in kind of their beautiful 1830s best. Um, and so this is a really super fun folding fan. All right. And again, we have some new, um, we have some new periodicals. So, um, and these ones persisted for a really long time. So the ladies book, which was published out of Philadelphia, started publication in the 1830s. And then Harper's Bazaar, which started publication, I believe in 1867. And, you know, technically that magazine still exists, right? As a women's um, interest and fashion magazine. So uh, women are definitely um, fashionable ideas are being disseminated throughout um, Europe and um, kind of the, the colonies of Europe. Uh, so we see kind of fashionable fans of this era, not just in England and France, but we see them in Spain. We see a lot of production of fans in Brazil and Argentina. And then we also see uh, fans being purchased and used in the US. Okay, so here's the first fan that is from the collection of the, um, of the Hammond Stanford Museum. So this is um, Matilda French's wedding fan and you can check it out online in the museum archives and it has a date of 1853. So we've kind of progressed into a different fan era right now. And these fans are very typical of what we find um, in the mid Victorian era. So what you can see here is we have this printed and painted leaf, right? So um, printing has definitely flourished. You have lithographs. You can do very ornamented scenes that are printed. And then those could be finished by painting or inking or with other kinds of printing. And then we have these um, fan sticks that are made out of mother of pearl. Um, and you can see um, that these are a little bit different than what we saw in the 18th century. So, you know, 100 years earlier, that fan we saw had a lot of space between the sticks where they are below the leaf. And here they're butted up right next to each other. So they're kind of forming a mass of this mother of pearl. Um, and where the, the um, fan sticks join the leaf, there's kind of this uh, rounded shoulder, right? So it has like shoulders and then it goes into a narrow part um, where the, the um, stick joins the leaf. And that is also very typical of mid uh, 19th century Victorian era fans. So if I saw this fan, I would say, yes, this is absolutely typical of a Victorian fan. So let's look at who's wearing it. So this is um, a portrait of Franklina Gray as a child and her mother Matilda. This is probably a little bit after um, what this wedding fan would be. Um, the dress she's wearing is a little bit later. But we can see from the fashions of the 1850s. So on the left, we have this fashion plate. So we're getting definitely this very belled um, look for the skirts. This is a little bit before we have the kind of cage crinoline. Um, so these shapes are supported by um, corded petticoats or multiple layers of petticoats. Um, we've lost the giant sleeve look of the 1830s. And it's kind of a little bit more of a streamlined, um, but very romantic look. And on the right hand side, this is not great resolution, but this is a ball gown and you can see that it's um, kind of very light and airy 
Um, a lot, a lot of fabric used for gowns of this era, multiple flounces, lots of gathering. All right. All right, so here we are um, just past the midpoint of the 19th century. So in this era, we see kind of the greatest extent of skirt width. Um, in the 1860s is where we start to see cage crinolines supporting skirts. Um, and again, we're seeing that optical illusion where women are wearing corsets and they are more supportive and tighter um, but they're also creating that optical illusion of a very narrow waist by having an extremely large skirt that goes below it. And we are seeing fans that start to match this. So gone are the very small, dainty, almost translucent fans of the Regency era. And we're moving into much more substantial um, fans for the mid, um, mid 19th century, the 1860s and the 1870s. Um, and also you can kind of see from this timeline as we go through the 1860s, the skirt mass is moving backwards. So where it's more balanced in the early 1860s, by 1868, we're seeing the um, bigger proportion of the skirt move towards the back. And then by the 1870s, we're seeing that develop into a bustle. So the bustle era, which is one of my other favorite eras of costuming. Um, and this also has a lot of ornamentation. Uh, sewing machines start to get widespread around that era. And so um, people are able to put more time into, uh, into making all of the ornamentation that goes on these gowns. All right. This is a very particular fan that was popular in the 1850s and 1860s. It's what's called a Jenny Lind fan. And it was named after the actress Jenny Lind. Um, and these maintain their popularity, I would say, from the 1850s all the way through probably the 1880s. Um, they, they differ in, in sizes throughout that era. Like some are very small, some are very big. But they all typically have this fan leaf where instead of a folding fan, it's a repeated um, you know, silk leaf or paper that are attached together. And a lot of them are ornamented with these really fun shaped sequins and with um, feathers at the top. So this is a really beautiful example of the era. I have seen these in wood. I have seen them in bone. Um, this might be an example that might be in ivory. So they come in all different price points and they were popular throughout kind of um, for, as an accessory as a woman's accessory for many different classes, right? So both upper and middle class. Right, again, here is a ballroom scene. This is a fashion plate of the era. Um, so we see kind of this ornamented. So like the fan has feathers and kind of ruffling shapes. We see that echoed in the dress of the era with these multiple flounces on these ball gown skirts um, and a lot of lace and ornamentation. And here's a woman in a, in a photograph holding a Jenny Lynn fan. So you can kind of see hers is fairly big. There are a lot of examples of those that are smaller. Um, it's definitely larger than her hand. It's, it's pretty substantial. It's not very dainty. Um, and the, you know, the rounded shapes of the fan echo nicely with kind of the rounded shape of her shoulders, um, the rounded shape of her dress styles. And then on the right hand side, you can see this really fun example of a dress from the era. Um, there are all sorts of like crazy trimming motifs. There's somebody made a reproduction of one that has essentially like a hashtag, like velvet ribbon hashtags. So lots of fun, fun examples of dress from this era. All right. And here is an example from Harper's Bazaar from 1871. And, um, you know, Harper's was definitely a major magazine in disseminating fashion um, throughout the US and other English speaking parts of the world. Um, and here's a fan that looks kind of like um, one of the fans we're gonna be looking at next. It has a narrow um, border of lace at the top. It has an embroidered um, satin stitch silk leaf. And then it has this, these fan sticks that are very close together. 
um, either a bone or a mother of pearl. Um, and so you could embroider your own fan leaf and then send it out to be um, put together by a fan maker. But again, at this point, you're probably purchasing um, your fans from a store or from a jeweler. So there were definitely, um, Duvalois in France is a big fan retailer. He's a jeweler. He also has a fan store in um, London. So, and, um, you know, Cartier made, made fans so that you can get very upscale fans from um, jewelers. All right, so here is another example from the museum um, that kind of looks a lot like that fan advertisement we were just looking at. So it has these beautiful either abalone or mother of pearl sticks and then this lace leaf. Um, and so you definitely see full lace leaves of this era. Um, you occasionally see them earlier than mid-Victorian, but I would say that they're not nearly as popular, right? They're more of a very expensive, rare item, um, but they're extremely popular this area. And, you know, popular enough that they were advertised in middle to upper class magazines. Right, and here is um, Franklina Gray on her wedding day. Um, she purchased this gown in Paris. And I believe um, there's a fantastic exhibit that the museum has up online right now about her grand tour that I recommend you all go look at. And um, I believe she mentions purchasing a fan in Paris. So Paris is definitely a place where fashion is coming from in this era, you know, worth some of the big fashion houses are there. Um, and so you would definitely, if you were very wealthy, you could purchase, if you went to Europe, you would purchase um, clothing from there and accessories. Um, and then one of the people that she, you know, met on her travels that was known um, to her family through her aunt was um, Princess Bernice from Hawaii. Um, and she's shown here in very fashionable Western dress, holding a hand fan, a folding hand fan. And I have this example here on the right hand side of, you know, an extant dress from this era that is very similar to what she's wearing with the closely fitted bodice, um, either, you know, a natural form bustled um, skirt and back of the bodice. So definitely um, this is very fashionable dress of the era and you can see how large her fan is. So she's holding it along her forearm. So we've gone back to an era where to balance out the large mass of skirts and the ornamentation that we have in Victorian and bustle dress, we have much larger fans again. Right. Um, one of the other things that we start seeing a lot in this era are these um, fixed feather fans. So this fan on the left hand side has um, flowers that are made of feathers and it has a whole stuffed hummingbird on it. Um, so, you know, stuffed birds, the decimation of bird life throughout the world was not just for hats. It also made its way into hand fans of this era. Um, and a lot of these fans with the feathers are coming from Brazil. So yeah, sadly enough, uh, you know, conservation is, is a movement that's starting, starting up in this era, right? Culminating with kind of the Audubon Society. But, you know, Western fashion is decimating bird population for ornamented accessories. So a lot of these fixed um, feather fans are coming from Brazil or, or North America. Now, again, on this right-hand side, we see a fashion plate from 1876. Um, and you can see there's all of this profusion of um, faux flowers, either paper or fabric flowers, and just yards and yards of fabric, lots of pleating, lots of ornamentation that goes into these fashions. All right, and then here are some other beautiful examples. Um, so again, we're seeing the back of this bustle gown um, with all the many rows of, um, of flounces and 
the woman on the right hand side in the back is holding a fan that is quite large. You can see how large it is. It's extending all the way up our forearm. And on the right hand side, there is a fan that is a printed example. It's from, I believe, an exhibition from the 1870s. So this is something that somebody could have bought as a souvenir, as a present for somebody when they went to go, you know, visit this exhibition. And you can see that um, the sticks are plain wood, right? So not every fan of this era is beautifully ornamented uh, mother of pearl. Um, you can get some very basic fan leaves uh, for, for fans that were not quite as expensive. Right. All right, and so let's look at our fashion timeline again. So we passed the first bustle era, skirts get a little bit narrower through the rear, um, trailing along the ground, usually called natural form. And then we enter the second bustle era in the 1880s and we kind of reach the maximum buff bustle where it's almost like a shelf. And we get kind of a more severe, very closely fitted bodice. And then that segues into the 1890s where the bustle all but disappears. It's reduced kind of like a, a pad right at the back. And um, we start getting these very essentially A-line elegant skirts with not a lot of profusion of ruffles. And those again, start to be balanced out by large sleeves. And so this is, I would say the greatest extent of fans for the 19th century. Um, this is you know, pretty much the time when fans are at their largest and there's a real proliferation of different kinds of styles. So here we have this painting, um, this woman in this beautiful gown, bustle gown with um, kind of the low bustled ruffles at the bottom. And she is holding an extremely large um, fan with a yellow silk leaf. And it looks like hers might be a ruffle at the top, but this example here that I have on the right hand side has feathers at the top, which was also very common. Um, to have either a whole fan leaf with applied feathers or to just have them along the top of a silk leaf. Sarai, yeah. um, here's your time warning. <laughs> oh, shoot, okay. I'm gonna go a little bit further, okay. All right, so, um, so here's another example of that same kind of style, not nearly as ornamented, um, much simpler reliefs and a very simple fan painting. So we've lost kind of the ornamentation of the mid, uh, uh, 19th century. And then here's some more examples of the fashion from the bustle era. Right. And then a couple more examples. All these women are holding fans for their um, evening dress and you can see how large they are. They're like practically the size of their torso. All right. And at this point, um, you could buy fans here in Oakland at um, Khan's Brothers uh, uh, department store, and you could also buy fans from Sears and Roebuck. So catalogs, and I had an example, but I don't know if we're going to get to it. All right, and here are feather fans. So these are kind of ostrich feathers, and these are some of the largest fans that were ever popular. Um, not quite like burlesque show size, but uh, a sizable, sizable fan. All right, and then um, as we progress into the beginning of the 20th century, the fan kind of hits its last points by the 1920s. So we have this um, return to kind of a classical simplicity. These fans in the um, 1900s into the 1910s kind of echo the ornamentation and the simplicity of the Regency era fans. Um, and then we start seeing these Edwardian fans and we start getting a lot of leaves of um, transparent silk. So silk fans from this era are almost always shattered um, because of the process that they used to make the silk has just not made it sturdy over time. But those kind of echo the kind of elegant nets and shears that we see in the fashion. And then the 1920s are kind of the last hurrah of the fan. Um, so on the right hand side, there's this very large feather fan um, with um, a fixed handle so that it's not folding at all. It's just a, and you know, it's probably a good foot or two maybe two feet large. And then on the left-hand side, we're getting plastics, right? So this is celluloid. It's a, it's a plastic material that can come in many different colors. Um, all right. And I did wanna cover the language of the fan because I know that a lot of people are very interested in it. So 
were there ever large ballrooms where you would flirt, you know, you as a young lady would flirt with your, your male suitor over, um, over a fan? Uh, so let's take this tale back to Paris. <laughs> So here we have the fan salon of Duvalois, who was a main fan producer. He started his store in 18, in I believe it was 1827. Um, there was a ball that supposedly happened that, you know, had fans be popular again. But while they might have dipped in popularity after the French Revolution, they were always a popular accessory. They just, you know, weren't maybe quite as popular. But Supposedly fans came back on the scene and he made them popular again. Um, and he also had an exhibition um, in England at the Crystal Palace and it was a huge success. So he had a store in London and in Paris. And you could go purchase your beautiful fancy fan from his store. Um, and you can still find some that, are, that have their boxes and their marketing material. So, and this is where the language of the fan came from. So there is practically no documentation for any 18th century source. Um, so if you're reading a book set in 1770, even if you're reading a book set in like 18, in the Regency era, and people are using the language of the fan, there is almost no documentation that exists. There's a couple um, theses, there's one written in French, and then there's a FANA article, the Fan Association of North America article that have looked extensively into any 18th century sources. Um, but what we do know is, you know, mid to late 19th century, when you bought a fan from Duvalwa, you got um, a booklet for the language of the fan. So, um, sorry if you're planning on flirting with guys, they probably do not know the language of the fan because they have not purchased a fan. Um, we do see some examples from the late 1790s. So this I th fan I think is either from 1797, which is called the conversation fan. And this was essentially a parlor game. So your girlfriends would have a similar fan and um, you would hold it in different um, configurations to ask them questions, but all the questions and the answers are printed on the fan. So you would basically like ask them question four by holding the fan in a certain way and they would reply based on the printed answers on the fan by holding their fan in that way. Um, these were just very briefly popular only around 1797 and 1798. Um, I've seen no other examples of these sorts of fans outside of this. Um, and these were both printed at around the same time. This one uses different colors and you would have a little tab that you raise um, to your friend across the room with a different color to ask them the question and they would raise the little color back to you to answer it. And again, all the questions and answers are printed on the fan. Um, and it's clear that you're talking to another young lady and not not to a guy. So sorry, ladies who wanted to flirt. Your fan signals, your language of the fan. Um, it's a fun thing, but it's it's more like uh, 50 sex tips in Cosmo. And it is a fantastic um, marketing ploy. So, um, you know, definitely successful because most of us have heard of it. And um, yeah, absolutely. So that's where most of the documentation for language of the fan comes from. All right. So if I have time, I did want to show you guys some real fans. So I'm going to turn on my webcam. So hopefully you guys can see that. All right. All right. So. This is an 18th century fan. Um, you can see that it has mother pearl sticks. It has lots of spaces in between. This one has one central motif. It doesn't really have anything on the sides, um, but it has like a very thick ornamented um, blade for the fan. And it's very carved and it's got a lot of like gold paint on them. Um, the reverse of these is not nearly as exciting. So. 
when we get into the Victorian era, the reverse of it will often have um, a nice ornamented painted leaf. But in the 18th century, we don't really see um, beautiful, we're, there's, some, there's some ornamentation, but we're mostly seeing most of it on the front. All right. Um, so this is one of those horn fans. You can see how incredibly translucent it is. Right, you can see my hand through this. And you can also see how small it is. It's like, you know, smaller than my hand is. Um, so this fan, I re-ribboned this one. I have some that I haven't fixed the ribbon on yet, but you know, they're very delicate and airy and you can see how they go with that kind of classical sensibility. This is one that I haven't re-ribboned yet, but you can see, uh, I'm gonna hold it up close. You can see that there's all these sequins where it would, you know, catch the light. Right. All right, and then here we start getting into kind of the 1820s, 1830s. Um, so one of the reasons we can tell kind of when this fan was painted is first of all, this leaf is, is mostly painted instead of printed. And also you're seeing kind of the fashions of this era. So kind of those larger sleeves, the more ornamented ha um, hands. Um, and, and it's a smaller fan, so it's smaller than most Victorian fans. And we're still getting kind of that 18th century fan blade style. Um, but we're getting a full painted leaf like we would have for Victorian era. And you can see on the reverse, there's an equally ornamented leaf on the reverse side. All right. So, here are some. Here are some examples of Jenny Lynn fans. So here is one with a silk leaf, with those sequins. Um, and again, it's this one's a pretty small fan, right? It's about the size of my hand. Um, this is one that's made of wood, so it's much simpler. Uh, you can see that it's sewn together in the back. All the fan leaves are sewn together, and it doesn't have nearly as much ornamentation. Um, here's a slightly later example. Um, and you're getting this very ornamented leaf from kind of that 1860s style. So we see these women with their like very large bell shaped dresses. Um, and then again, this is the Jenny Lynn style with the individual um, parts of the leaf. But this one's much larger, like it's it's definitely like at least, you know, the size of my hand and a half. So this is definitely towards like the 1860s rather than the 1850s. And then remember that lace fan we saw in the slideshow that the museum has one in their collection. Um, this is an example of a very similar one, right? So we've got these mother of pearl or abalone or other kinds of very ornamented sticks. Um, it's again, a very large fan. It's much larger than my hand. And we have this um, leaf that's entirely made of lace. Right. And then, you know, we could also get kind of a combination where we have this um, printed and painted leaf here and these um, fan blades, the sticks here are dyed. So these are like, you know, probably mother of pearl and they're dyed purple. So they have this very beautiful color. Hold that up a little bit, you guys can see. And then kind of the greatest extent of fans. So um, here is a beautiful fan from probably the 1880s. Um, I'm gonna hold my hand next to it. Like, it's practically like the whole, almost as long as my forearm, like my hand and my forearm here. Um, and so, you know, kind of when you're looking at those women in their ball gowns, this is the sort of fans that they're holding. Um, and so we don't have these like very intricate painted scenes. Um, it's a much simpler style. The backs are typically just plain fabric. Um, and it ha but it has these nice polished wooden sticks. Okay. 
and we start to get um, kind of interesting shapes. So towards the end of the 19th century, we start to get this shape that's very popular in the 1910s and then into the 1920s. So here's one with a painted bird peacock thing on it. And then here's a beautiful fan that has an actual like metal net mesh. This is probably around 1910. And I'll hold it a little closer. You guys can see all the sequins. Right. Right, and then um, there's always kind of a, you know, in the late Victorian, there's a bit of a fad for Orientalism and you get kind of these very large fans that are actually very similar to ones that you could purchase today that are imported. Again, this is an enormous fan. It's all the way here on my table. You can't even see the whole thing. Um, you know, just interesting construction method. But if you wanted to dress up for an event today that was set in the 1890s, um, you could still get kind of a similar style purchase. And then this is a celluloid fan. So the kind of the, the last hurrah of the fan is the 1920s, where we get these teeny tiny celluloid fans. And again, they're very reminiscent of the Regency era. They're um, translucent. And then we get these gigantic feather fans. Um, at the other end. And they're both popular at the same time. So um, I wanted to leave some time for questions. I hope there's still some time. So um, is that good? <laughs>